called Peaksville. On a given morning not too long ago, the rest of the world disappeared, and Peaksville was left all alone. Its inhabitants were never sure whether the world was destroyed and only Peaksville left untouched, or whether the village had somehow been taken away. They were, on the other hand, sure of one thing, the cause. A monster had arrived in the village. Now I'd like to introduce you to some of the people in Peaksville, Ohio. This is Mr. Fremont. It's in his farmhouse that the monster resides. And this is Aunt Amy, who probably had more control over the monster in the beginning than almost anyone. But one day she forgot. She began to sing aloud. Now the monster doesn't like singing, so his mind snapped at her. She sings no more. He took away the automobiles, the electricity, the machines, because they displeased him. And he moved an entire community back into the dark ages. Just by using his mind, this particular monster can read minds, you see. This is the monster. His name is Anthony Fremont. He's six years old with a cute little boy face and blue guileless eyes. But when those eyes look at you, you'd better start thinking happy thoughts. Howdy, Anthony. Mighty good to see you today. What are you doing, Anthony? I made a gopher with three heads. I ain't never seen a gopher with three heads before. I'll make him dead now. I'm tired of playing with him. Be dead. Gopher, you be dead. That's, that's real fine, Anthony. You're a good boy, Anthony. We all love you. Howdy, Miss Freeman. Howdy, Bill. Anthony just loves tomato soup, don't he? So, so I brought that. I gotta get going, Miss Fremont. I'll see you tonight, Bill. Tonight? Tonight's television night. Anthony's gonna put a nice picture on television. And we're gonna have the surprise party for Dan Hollis. A real nice surprise party. Oh, I'll, I'll be here, Miss Fremont. I'll certainly be here.
sneak up behind you and lay something heavy across your skull and end this once and for all. You're a bad man. You're a very bad man. Somebody end this now. What are you thinking about me? Alright, welcome back to the Atlanta Child Murders Revisited, video number 39. And we're going to call this The Bad Man. Or we could call it The Monster, but anyway. Um, so, this is a very poor uh, edited version of this Twilight Zone episode where this kid was basically in control. He had psychic powers, he could make people disappear, turn them into things, he could read minds, all these kinds of things. And but he didn't have the maturity of an adult. So he basically wiped out the world and left the adults to serve him. Okay, and they all lived in fear of this kid, this loose cannon rolling around on the deck. You never know what he was gonna do or if or if maybe you thought a bad thought and the kid didn't like it and then he would turn you into a jack-in-the-box and so I apologize for the poor quality that was the only one I could find I also apologize for my audio quality I um, the headset that I was using prior it's gone and so now I'm on a backup until I can um, find get this new audio um, headset to come in get a little better quality but we keep driving on though and I've tried to tune it up a little bit here um, the reason I'm posting this video is because it's basically an analogy for Wayne Williams and his fam his familiar relationships okay he was this terror to his elderly parents this is the idea that I'm getting he could do no wrong he could make his parents basically do whatever he wanted look the other way bail him out of bankruptcy bail him out of jail and he had them firmly under his control and so that's what I think is emerging from what I'm reading and what I'm seeing about Wayne Williams and his father because again there's no way you could take 25 30 children into that room and adults and strangle them even if it's just once a month and they not notice they don't see something's wrong or at least see the children alive and then see later on the news that same child they saw was found dead so again you're left with just a few options you're either either Homer Williams is participating in the murders or they have Wayne Williams has his mother and father in living in fear and controlling them out of fear or they're just blatantly ignorant and really heavy sleepers which I very much doubt that <coughs> okay so we're gonna get back into the geography here 
and uh, see where we're at. All right, so the next one is 3885 Old Gordon Road, Northwest Atlanta. It's Milton Harvey, and it's right down here. Again, off of I-20, off of Fulton Industrial, still in Wayne Williams area here. And let's take a look at this address here. Hold on one second. Again, he was last seen right in this area. It's still, even today, 40 years later, it's still a very empty, lonely area. Even though it's Fulton Industrial, there's not a lot of stores or traffic around there. And we'll take a look at Milton Harvey real quick. It said Milton Harvey, age 14. He was the third victim. Disappeared 4 September 1979 off of Old Gordon Road. That's where we're looking at right now. And of course he was found out by uh, Red Wine Road. And again this is one of those that doesn't have any fibers on him but it says here his um, let's see his skeletal remains were found. So that means he was out there quite a long time. <coughs> and any fibers that he had had on him would have been washed off. So that's one of the reasons there. All right, on to the next one. And so this is the bridge off Bankhead Highway. A good spot when it's not busy to drop off bodies and then they show up down the Chattahoochee here and let's take a look at that real quick although Bankhead Highway is quite busy so I can't imagine he used this one a lot but that's why he would have used the next bridge down which been, would have had a lot less traffic alright let's take a look at this one yeah you see all the traffic so you got one two three four five six seven eight nine ten cars so not a great place but maybe at three in the morning you know you could park the station wagon right here drop the tail down do the farmers carry boom right over the right over the the railing right there again you see that concrete barrier if you go stand up to that concrete barrier it'll probably hit you about thigh high or maybe even waist high if you're short but still not a great area but um, if you have no other alternative, like this bridge or the next bridge down, those would probably be more preferable. All right, on to the next one. We've got Lorenzo Pugh, home address 2548 Hollywood Court. I'm sorry, Terry Lorenzo Pugh. Again, so you can see this one is right in his area. actually hold on one second yeah there it is I don't have it down exactly this is Hollywood there's no Hollywood court so hold on one second two five four eight all right so unfortunately I'm not able to find this uh, address here this is his Terry Pugh's home address but see if you get up to about right here you're at 2102 and the address is 2548 and it says court and this one says road so if you go up further see it's close but you're at 2081 and then it turns into Bolton Road so I think we've got either a messed up address yeah see it's supposed to be going south see this is what I have to do is I actually go out on Google Maps and physically track down the address every single one 
And this is probably one reason I need to go to Atlanta so I can take a look at these areas. Yeah, because it's 2-5. See, it turns into Bolton Road right there. And there is no Hollywood Court. You see, this intersection, Bolton Road goes off this way. And Hollywood ends right there. Let's see. Yeah, 2150 is what it's saying. Yeah, two, or 2102. So, we're not able to find that one. That's okay. All right. Um, but if you remember Terry Pugh, okay, let's actually find um, Lawrence Terry Pugh. Hold on one second. Okay, there's a, also a note here saying that the very first victim, um, Eddie Hope Smith, who lived at Kimberly Court 1375 um, Southwest Way, and he was the one that was last seen at the Greenbrier Skating Rink, that Terry Pugh also once lived in the, ser the same very complex, or at least the same apartment, that uh, the first victim, Edward Smith, lived in. So there's a connection right there. And um, let me find Pew again. Hold on one second. Yeah, Terry Lawrence Pew. Lorenzo Pew, age 15. Home address 2548. He was last seen at the Crystals, that, that famous Crystals there, on Memorial Drive. And then he was the one that was found out near Sigmund Road. Remember the one about the 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 drunk white guy that called the minister and said yeah I killed the kid and left his body at Sigmund Road uh, the minister called the police they went out there couldn't find anything it went in the news the guy called back angry and said yeah you went to the wrong place the police had bugged the phone and traced the call they got the guy and found out arrested him found out he was lying he was just drunk all that went in the newspaper and then Wayne Williams, with his sick sense of humor, decided to kill Terry Pugh and take his body and dump it over by his buddy um, Larry Peterson's office at the crime lab over in Conyers, Georgia, just like a mile away. Then we're reading FBI reports that show that a Rockdale County Sheriff's deputy was manning a road blockade on Sigmund Road and identified Wayne Williams as being someone who approached the police blockade offering his services as a photographer for, for the crime scene. And he completely identified Wayne Williams in January of 1981. So not only did he kill Terry Pugh and dump his body over by his buddy Larry Peterson to taunt him then he comes in like his dad has been doing many times Homer's done this many times showed up at crime scenes showed up at funerals of victims and try to take pictures very crazy mentality there so what that's telling you he's in, he's in his God mode he thinks that he's all powerful he can do anything and get away with it and no one's gonna catch him and so far he's right in January of 1981 he's been killing for at least a year and a half and no one's caught him so he thinks that in his Gemini personality that he's invincible all right we'll keep moving on look at one more and then we'll stop all right so this one is um, 2224 James Jackson's Parkway Northwest. Okay, this is the bridge that Wayne Williams is caught on. Well, not caught on, but 
seen throwing a body into the Chattahoochee and then he's followed up to 285 and pulled over there and notice the location compared to some of the victims and somewhere in here is, is Lorenzo Pugh okay very close by let's take a look at the bridge scene and we'll end that video section there hold on one second all right so look at the God's eye view here so here's the bridge essentially what you have is a police recruit over on this side and a police recruit over on this side and then you got a special agent probably down one of these roads over here back in here way off the road then you got another special agent over here so what happens is Wayne Williams drives down here he stops he does his little fireman carry he throws Nathaniel Keeter off the bridge the police recruit hears the body hit the water he shines his flashlight down he can't see anything he looks up doesn't see anything for a moment and then as Wayne William gets in the car and cranks the car up and turns the lights on he sees the car he radios the Atlanta Police Department man starts to pull out from his concealed position here the SA pulls forward and can see Wayne Williams car the Atlanta policeman can see Wayne Williams car he drives down to this I guess this is starving Marvin pulls in the parking lot turns around and drives back up the bridge where the Atlanta Police Department patrolman and the special agent follow him up the road all the way up across 285 he gets onto 285 and then they stop him somewhere around in here okay now Wayne Williams will tell you that he didn't throw anything off the bridge but if you didn't throw anything off the bridge why'd you even bother coming this way why not just keep driving down this road past some of the other victims that you've you've killed and go home it doesn't make any sense so let's take a look a little closer here now we can't there's no um, pictures of the area where the recruit was was at but you can probably approximate it was probably right in here because there's power lines so he can get closer to the uh, get closer to the river right there the other recruit is going to be over here in this section okay let's take a look at the bridge now this bridge has been renovated and updated so it's not exactly the same look it's been resurfaced they put in a new fence here a new barrier I don't know why they just put it up here maybe they don't want people testing out throwing the body off but again approximately you can Wayne Williams could drive up here let's see if we can find that metal plate they probably paved over the metal plate Yeah, see there would have been a joint with a metal plate right in there but this has probably been resurfaced and it's my understanding that he was closer to this side yeah, wherever there's joints they're gonna have a see they'll put a metal plate in so when cars are going across you see you see the concrete right there this one's got a metal plate underneath it the old ones would put a metal plate over the top that way when the car is going across okay it the the weight won't push down on the concrete and start collapsing the concrete so they put a metal plate it kind of rode up and rode down to protect the, the concrete joints there you might be able to find a metal plate let's see I doubt it they probably have concreted over it and replaced it so he would have driven down here and he drove into this used to be a starving Marvin's I believe they said 
went in here. He says that he went in, got some cardboard boxes, um, made a phone call to uh, Cheryl Johnson, and then he says two different stories. He says that the in one version he says that uh, when he called the number it was disconnected. And then another version he tells the FBI that when he called it the people said she she ain't here and hung up. In other versions he says he calls the number at at Atlanta Road. There's no way he could have called the number from here because there was a patrolman right down here that had eyes on him. Also, if you look up the road, up here there was a special agent. And again, it's dark. You can see the lights of the headlights and the brake lights. So they had eyes on him. There were no other cars in the area. He says that there are two pure later trucks driving across the bridge at the same time. Then another version he says there was another vehicle going the opposite direction. In another version he says the pure later trucks were going the going north instead of south. The special agents to the FBI went and interviewed the headquarters manager for pure later and found out there would have been absolutely no pure later trucks on that bridge in that route at that time 2.50 in the morning. And they went over all the, r- the records and logs. This is the FBI professionals working. Okay? Alright. So, we'll move on here. Hold on one second. Again, being a professional and dealing with reality and dealing with evidence you always have to educate yourself on things you don't know about which is what I spend my life doing I'm not a detective I'm not involved in investigations or anything like that but when I read about something and I don't understand it I google it and try to find out more information if I blow it off and say oh I'm not interested in that because my aunt's hairdresser's dog's cat said that so-and-so saw Wayne Williams and a white guy or so-and-so saw the Klan guy, then I'm not helping myself. I'm just, when you don't educate yourself and grow and learn things, even if they're painful, even if you may not agree with them in the beginning, you're just circling like a dog chasing his tail learning nothing and not growing and going nowhere anyway so it says we're going to get back on to trace evidence here it says many techniques are used in protection of trace evidence for criminal investigations although all must be photographed as soon as possible and while still in place samples may be collected by shaking brushing tapping vacuuming, swabbing, and hand-picking. See, this is why I had a problem in the OJ case with this uh, racist cop detective that said he saw this and he saw that, but he never um, left a note for the patrolman or the forensics expert to take a picture of it or to take a sample of it. And then it was destroyed. It was just what he said that he saw. And that's no good. Okay? Only thing that counts, it's not like horseshoes. It doesn't count being close by or bocce ball. It only counts if you hit, you know, you you make that home run, you get that evidence there. That's all that matters. Being close doesn't count. Anyway, so samples may be collected by shaking, brushing, tapping, vacuuming, swabbing, and handpicking. So that's what we have here. We've got Larry Peterson and the other forensic experts going in with their tweezers and their magnifying glass and pulling these fibers off the bodies. They're going into Wayne Williams' car and the Wayne Williams' carpet and vacuuming hairs 
and vacuuming fibers out of the carpet and off the rugs in his car. It says great care may be needed to prevent contamination with other substances such as natural oil and sweat on the hand of the collector. So Larry Peterson isn't going in there with no gloves and just picking up these fibers with his fingers. He's going in there with rubber gloves and with uh, tweezers. In some s cases, such as with oil and grease, solvent extraction can be used to collect the evidence for analysis. The method used for collection is generally dependent on both the type of the evidence and from where or what source of object is being collected. Trace evidence is also found in much smaller amounts at crime scenes. The scientific working group materials analysis was created has created guidelines to ensure proper protection and collection of trace evidence. So when people say that, you know, the police made up the evidence, they faked the evidence, they were mistaken about the evidence, those are people who are ignorant that don't know what they're talking about. Because there's certain guidelines that all police have read up on, all police have studied up on, and they all follow the same procedures. That way, if another, you know, what if Larry Peterson or one of the forensics person is sick that day and they find a body? They can't just leave the body out there for Larry Peterson to get better. Okay? So they're going to call out some other forensics expert that's been educated in the same procedures to go out there and conduct the investigation and collection of, of evidence. All right. So it says the document... Uh, and, and another thing about Larry Peterson also, he wasn't always at every crime scene. There were Atlanta Police Department men picking up fibers, picking up evidence, and sending that to him to analyze. So, they're all following a standard trace evidence procedures with scientific guidelines. The document sets out steps to follow to ensure proper documentations, tips to avoid contamination and loss of evidence, proper detection, collection and preservation techniques, as well as considerations for specific types of trace materials. The FBI has even implemented these standards into their working work revolving trace evidence. So everyone, every police agency out there is on the same procedures they follow and another reason why that is is because if you've got if the temp the defense team hires a forensics expert to go in and start questioning about how evidence was collected how fibers were collected he's going to have a working knowledge of what is standard in the industry to do across the board across the nation and if they vary from that he's gonna be able to tear them to pieces okay oh you didn't follow this procedure you didn't follow this uh, procedure how can we be guaranteed that uh, any of your evidence that you've collected is actually hasn't been contaminated this is why Forensics and fiber evidence people follow the same scientific procedures across the board, across the country, across all police departments. Analysis of trace materials must often begin with visual examination of the evidence, usually involving macro photography. That means close up. This is then usually followed by microscopic analysis. So you take the fiber evidence. And so what Larry Peterson was doing is he was taking, okay, fiber evidence from, say, victim A and putting it side by side in a dual microscope 
with fiber evidence from victim C or D or F puts them side by side lines them up end to end and compares them and he finds out they're very similar and then also in that rain he takes fiber evidence collected from Wayne Williams house from that violet acetate bedspread from the green carpet from the yellow acetate blanket lines that up with the fibers found on the victims and compares them and they come up almost exactly and it's the closest to any out of all the search warrants and searches they've had at the KKK house at Uncle Tom's house the ones in Wayne Williams house were the only ones that came even close to matching all right and it's not just Larry Peterson you can take anyone from any forensics department and show them the same evidence and they're going to come up with the same conclusion. That's science. Because what science is re is repeatable. Okay? It's measurable. Not only Larry Peterson's world, but any forensic expert who's been schooled and trained on standard procedures is going to come up with the exact same conclusion. That's science. Again, it's not, you know, your aunt so-and-so heard her hairdresser said that so-and-so heard her dog dress, her dog groomer's grandma said she saw this and she saw that. That's not science. That's not evidence. This is science. All right. Let's see. Yeah, and they're talking about a stero stereo microscope. Stereo means two. So they got two microscopic lenses that are looking at separate fibers, and they're putting them up on a screen in comparison, side by side, and they're gonna they should match. SEM is especially useful uh, because x-ray analysis can be conducted on selected areas of the sample uh, so a form of microanalysis and that's another thing I we heard we we saw yesterday in one of the videos that one of the so-called forensic experts for the defense team went into outside Mary Wilkins office and cut fi uh, green fibers from a carpet outside her office and then said all oh, these look very similar to the green carpet fiber sound in Wayne Williams house but he didn't have a stereo microscopic scanning electronic microscope to compare them he was just looking at the naked eye it's green it's green no but when you get down to the microscopic level you're gonna find that that green carpet and Mary welcomes out front of her how um, office there didn't have the trilobe fiber section in it which these trilobes had like three different points on them they kind of looked like boomerangs with a protruding point on the top and when you compare those to other green fibers, they were just strands of fibers. They didn't look the same at all. But he was hoping he could get away with that by just showing the jury and knowing that the jury isn't scientific experts, that they wouldn't know the difference. But thank God Larry Peterson educated the jury over four days on his procedures and which is standard across the board in what they do. All right, so we're going to move on to a news article. All right, so again, this is this news article back from 19, I believe about April of 1981. This is before Wayne Williams was caught. And you got Brown going to these forums, you know, trying to calm people's nerves and ask, answering questions. 
Someone raises a question that trails Brown from forum to forum. Ask about race and murders. Uh, some Atlantans fear racial violence if a serial killer is discovered to be white. Some see a connection between the child murders and recent attacks on blacks in other cities. Why, Brown is now asked, does the city deny that the killings are racist? Atlanta, he answered, is a little wearily, does not live in isolation. It is difficult to separate these incidents around the country, but we can't, we can't say the murderers here are racially motivated because we don't know the motivation. We don't exclude any possibility. Now, if you do a study or read over studies of serial killers, they usually stay within their, their own city, urban areas, no more than like a, an hour away. They're not going to travel, you know, from Atlanta down to Miami to kill someone and come back. Because they're not comfortable in those areas. They kill in the city because they're comfortable and they know where to hide the body, where to pick up people, the back streets, things like that. Just like Wayne Williams says that he does. Okay? Now there are serial killers that kill in one city and then they move to another city and start repeating the same killings there. But they're not, they're living in that area at that time. And this is... Um, Ted Bundy, he was living in Seattle, then went to school, I believe, in Utah, and started killing in that general area of Utah and uh, Colorado. Let's see. Uh, the commissioner, his frustration as powerful as that of the audience, leaves Northside High in an unobtrusive old Chevrolet chauffeured by a detective bodyguard. On nights like these before going on to another engagement or heading home to his family with a full briefcase he often stops for dinner at Ivy South a dimly lit midtown restaurant owned by Benny Ivy hold on one second alright so it doesn't like that place exists but if it's in midtown uh, he's probably pretty close to the San Suchi lounge and that's where Wayne Williams was, hang was hanging out or is still hanging out and this is in April so where he's going to eat at a, rel a brother's diner or a sister, let's say a woman whose sister is married to one of Brown's brothers. So at a relative's diner, he's eating nearby where the killer is going to be going next to get his next victim. We're all home folks here, Miss Ivy says. Pat, he's always been called Pat comes in and eats the same thing all the time a bowl of gumbo ribs and colored greens and yams he tries to relax but you can see that these killings are working on him he's got bags under his eyes and he's so tight he's tapping on the table with his fingers tapping and tapping on the evening of May 21st 1979 a year after he became commissioner Brown was filling in for Mayor Jackson at the award ceremony in a theater um, in the well-to-do Buckhead section of the city. As he was reading a proclamation, he fainted and slumped to the stage. He had been working day in and day out and was exhausted. When lung tests at the hospital also showed that he was smoking too much, he gave up cigarettes altogether but no sooner was the commissioner out of the hospital and back on his feet than a man scavenging for redeemable aluminum cans in Atlanta's isolated Niski Lake, I thought it was a woman actually, uh, area made a discovery that in time would change Brown's life and the life of the city of 425,000. For just as Brown, the son of fruit picker whose schooling ended in the third grade, had reached the pinnacle of his profession after years of study and struggle he was caught up in one of the strangest and most heart-rendering episodes in the annals of American crime. At first the man searching for cans on July 28, 1979 thought he had come upon the remains of a dead animal 
but moving closer he noticed black trousers, a belt, and a torso of a black boy who turned out to be 13-year-old Alfred Evans, which is interesting because Alfred Evans disappeared right there in Midtown where Brown, near where Brown is eating. Lacking other physical signs, medical examiners assumed that Evans had been asphyxiated after disappearing from his southwest home on July 25th. In the 90 degree heat, a sickening odor of decomposition hung over the dump, but the smell was not so much from Evans as from still another body lying in the underbrush 150 feet away. So I was just listening to the Atlanta Monster again for the third time, and he's interviewing Popcorn, this FBI agent, and he says, is it FBI? I believe it's popcorn, or maybe it's another one. Anyway, a policeman, he smells this smell, and it's not Alfred, so he sends another policeman off in the direction of the smell, and they find Edward Smith, his body there. So Edward Smith, a 14-year-old, was last seen leaving a skating rink near the home in southwest Atlanta on July 20, and had been shot to death with one bullet uh, that passed through his body. Now, how you could die from a damn 22 year old, a, a damn 22 bullet, I don't know, but I guess it's possible. That was the beginning. Two cases linked by the locations of the bodies and differing in that respect and others from the eight or so child murders that occur each year in Atlanta. While these victims, like the 26, the task forces investigating are often young black males. The crimes are usually committed in the heat of passion by relatives or acquaintances. The bodies are found with dispatch and the cases are solved quickly. So what they're saying is that usually when someone's killed or child is killed, they're found at the location that they're killed. You know, the crime of passion, uh, somebody gets angry and pulls a knife and stabs someone, uh, shoots someone at a bar. It's always right there where the victim dies where, they're, where they were killed. But in these cases, the victims were dying and they've been taken someplace else. And again, this is why I emphasize on this that the killing stopped when Wayne Williams got arrested because... I've gone over a lot of the newspapers and I've gone over a lot of the victims on the list and none of them were asphyxiated, that means strangled, or ligature strangled with a rope, and disappeared and their body ends up someplace else, like in the woods or in the river being dumped. That completely stopped. Now there are plenty of people that got killed, they got shot you know, got stabbed, whatever, but nothing in that pattern. That's about three or four major points, and it doesn't repeat itself ever again after that, after Wayne Williams gets arrested on that bridge. So, for example, two months after Evans and Smith's death, an eight-year-old black boy was shot to death, and the same day an uncle of the victim was charged with the crime. Some months later, a black youth of 16 was fatally shot, and within hours, his sister was erect arrested. Now, let's not forget that with the Lover's Lane murders that occurred two years before, the guy was using a gun and shooting people, okay, in their car that were parking at these, at these you know, late night parks that three in the morning, the same time that Wayne Williams is get caught on the bridge, the same time that Wayne Williams is always hanging out. And let's not forget that a similar crime to the, the um, Lover's Lane murders occurred at Thurl High School where one of the victims also attended that high school, okay, about two weeks before the first victim disappeared. And then, 
the person that was a 22 that was used in those shootings and then the first victim gets shot with the 22 it's after then that Williams perfects his ligature strangulation with the rope and that's what he uses from there on or stabbing and also he chooses younger victims he's not going after 18 19 20 21 year old parking victims it's later at the very end that he's doing house cleaning and taking out the adults his Gemini crew that either has been helping him with the murders has knowledge of him doing the murders or may start to think that maybe it's him that was doing the murders anyway we'll move on it says on November 5th 1979 however police were confronted with the skeletal remains of Milton Harvey found in a remote section of East Point a community immediately southwest of Atlanta again where his body was found okay was close by to the East Point police substation remember he had been arrested three years before for imitating a, a police officer okay all right so we'll pick this up um, in the next video and we'll keep driving on all right we're gonna pick it up here with Soledad but few are aware of a th third test given by the FBI examiner Richard Ratcliffe the result? In layman's terms, they passed. He did. He wasn't involved in killing Jones. Only days after Wayne Williams was convicted of killing two adults, Atlanta's police commissioner closed the books on 21 other. Hold murders. on one second. This from CNN's report at the time. Bobby Tolan said Williams asked him once, had he ever considered how many blacks could be eliminated? by killing one nigger child. But unknown to either side, Tolan was not his real name. In fact, he had a criminal record. He testified under a false name, had an extensive arrest record under his real name. I'm not sure that we knew all of that at the time uh, or it was disclosed to us. Rogers' home is but eight blocks away from where he was found today. Then there was the murder of Larry Rogers, a retarded youth. This witness testified she saw Rogers slumped over in a station wagon as Wayne Williams drove away. But another person also saw Rogers in that station wagon at that same intersection that day. He helped a police artist draw this sketch. It does not look like Wayne Williams. However, the defense never called the other witness to ask about the sketch. No, I don't, I don't even remember seeing that. Supporters of Wayne Williams say there was one murder which shows the fiber evidence could be faulty. The death of 12-year-old Clifford Jones, left by a dumpster in an alley on a summer night in 1980. Mary Welcome agreed when Justice Smith wrote the defense attorneys were ineffective. We were rendered ineffective. We were rendered incompetent because of the lack of funds, lack of time, and the lack of resources. Absolutely. Things did go wrong in the trial that should not have. An ambulance driver suggested an explosive motive for Wayne Williams. This from CNN's report at the time. Bobby Tolan said Williams asked him once, had he ever... Oh. All right, sorry about that. I should have turned it off, but uh, that was interesting. So they're going to talk about this ambulance driver, okay? So one thing about ambulances is that police interviewed some ambulance drivers that had encountered Wayne Williams. There was like an ambulance station, I believe, in East Point at Southwest Atlanta that would respond to, you know, different situations on the scanner whenever they were called and they said that Wayne Williams would often you know come by there to find out what kind of news was going on but it also would challenge them to fights he was very aggressive to them he also would flash a badge he had a, like a, a police badge that he would use and another thing that's interesting that I just found out is that his I, I believe this is correct I'm still looking. 
that his business partner, Jim James Comento, okay, was a white guy that was involved with an ambulance service, okay, and that he had tried to um, get his ambulance service under the city of Atlanta, signed up as a contract under the city of Atlanta, public safety commissioner, public safety commissioner Brown had rejected that, and that was about 1980, I believe. But I did find a James or Jim James Comento living in Buckhead, just literally right across Highway 40, 400, from where the old uh, recording studio was that James Comento and Wayne Williams had been seen at, and that James Comento had a green station wagon that many victims had seen and had uh, seen or many of the witnesses had seen the victims getting into a green station wagon either with a black male or a white male and then we're gonna we read that statement earlier which said that one of the people who knew Luby Getter went to an audition at Wayne Williams studio in Buckhead and saw James Comento and saw Wayne Williams and saw Wayne Williams loading equipment recording equipment into a green station wagon and then you'll see there's other reports of other witnesses seeing the victim last seen getting into a blue station wagon or a white station wagon with a black male and a white male specifically I'm talking about I believe it was Mathis off of um, Abernathy there and then also Aaron White was seen at a shopping center getting into a white station wagon with a black male and a white male so we could be looking at James Comento there and James Comento is still alive he's about 70 about 69 70 years old and he's living in Buckhead now don't go chasing after James 70 year old James Comento there's no proof he's involved in anything but and also we just read FBI memos when Wayne Williams is stopped on the bridge he mentions Nova Entertainment and that oh yeah it's about those kids right that you're stopping me and yeah well my business partner James Comento has already been interviewed by the police in regards to that oh and then a few more things I'm sorry um, I read yesterday I believe yesterday that Homer Williams and James Comento show up at the home of Mathis after he disappears and inquires about getting a permit for a scanner to be installed in their car and again James Comento is involved with the um, ambulance service and involved with the city he's got a scanner also I don't know why he would be involved with Wayne Williams in the recording business but there it is very very strange but anyway, we're going to get into this one here uh, with this ambulance driver also that had encountered Wayne Williams. An ambulance driver suggests an explosive motive for Wayne Williams. This from CNN's report at the time. Bobby Tolan said Williams asked him once, had he ever considered how many blacks could be eliminated by killing one nigger child? But unknown to either side, Tolan was not his real name. In fact, he had a criminal record. He testified under a false name, had an extensive arrest record under his real name. I'm not sure that we knew all of that at the time, uh, or it was disclosed to us. Rogers' home is but eight blocks away from where he was found today. Then there was the murder of Larry Rogers, a retarded youth. And that's one bad thing they do about this. They just throw it out there, but don't get into it anymore. And... He's not the only one that makes that indication. There's another woman who um, had a similar situation to Wayne Williams where she was um, recording 
for helping people, young children, with their music business. And when Williams came over there and would stare at the kids and was interested in what she was doing, and so he started copying that. That's what he did. And she mentioned that he didn't seem to like poor black youths, that they seemed to be holding him down. And so there is maybe a little bit of racism, some <coughs> inter-race racism going on there that, you know, like I was mentioning in my earlier videos, it's kind of the reverse Schindler, you know, uh, situation. You know, Schindler's List, that movie where he saved a thousand Jews at his factory. And from there, there are descendants of those thousand Jews called the Schindler Juden. Okay, and from those thousand descendants, I believe it's something like fifty thousand, you know, children or children, grandchildren, great grandchildren are the descendants from those thousand that he saved. So, you know, and there's a saying that's in the movie, but it's also in the Bible. It says, "One who saves a life saves all of humanity." So. In the kind of a reverse reverse of that, Wayne Williams is thinking, hey, you know, if I kill one child, they're going to have maybe five children, and then those five children are going to have five children, and then, there's by, you know, within 40 years, you could have, let's see, so if you got, he killed 30, and each one of them had five children, and each one of those five children had five grandchildren and each one of those five children grandchildren had five great grandchildren just by killing 30 you've killed off 3,750 so that's what he's talking about there anyway we'll keep going this witness testified she saw Rogers slumped over in a station wagon as Wayne Williams drove away but another person also saw Rogers in that station wagon at that same intersection that day. He helped a police artist draw this sketch. It does not look like Wayne Williams. Well, I However, beg to differ. I beg to differ. Because if you think about it, if Wayne Williams is reading books on police techniques and things like that, and a, a, um, identification and stuff, don't you think he would be smart enough to change his look? I mean, when he found him on the bridge, he was wearing a baseball cap. Okay, there was another witness that saw a guy wearing a baseball cap with no glasses. So, you know, don't you think that he would change up his looks? Maybe wear a wig? Maybe wear a mustache? Maybe wear a hat? change up his clothes, change around his cars, go from a police car looking car to a white station wagon to a blue station wagon to a green station wagon. And then what's with all those three rental cars? So he's doing all these different things and then also in varying locations where he's picking up people in very p various police districts, and he's dumping off bodies in varying police districts. He's doing all these things to confuse people, and it's working. That could easily be Wayne Williams right there. Personally, I don't see how you could see someone through a glass window in a car and get a good description like that. That's an enhanced artist description anyway we'll keep going and who's to say Wayne Williams doesn't have a partner one of his Gemini crew that looks like that the defense never called the other witness to ask about the sketch no I don't I don't even remember seeing that supporters of Wayne Williams say there was one see the reason she wouldn't have seen that is because Wayne Williams wasn't on trial for killing Larry Rogers. So they wouldn't have had to have introduced that evidence to them. And it's called disclosure. Because they didn't use that picture. They didn't use that witness. Okay. They wouldn't have had to disclose it. One murder which 
that shows the fiber evidence could be faulty. The death of 12-year-old Clifford Jones, left by a dumpster in an alley on a summer night in 1980. Some of those unusual green carpet fibers were on his body. Yet another boy said he saw a coin laundry operator kill Clifford Jones. Detective Welcome Harris said... Again, they're going to go up to it right here. The witnesses are absolutely notoriously horrible. The fiber evidence is what counts. Witnesses see things. You know, people saw Nathaniel, say they saw Nathaniel Cater. Three witnesses say they saw Nathaniel Cater after he, after Wayne Williams was stopped on the bridge. Did they talk to Nathaniel Cater? Did they shake hands with Nathaniel Cater? No. They saw him from a distance. They didn't wave at him, hey, Nathaniel. And he waved back, nothing like that. So witness testimony is absolutely horrendously horrible. It's fiber evidence and forensics and DNA. That's what counts. Said the boy was not believable. He exaggerated stuff. He could, in other words, he was open to suggestions. And if you say that uh, Mickey Mouse was up there. Mickey Mouse. Sense that you wanted him to say that. He said, yeah. Yeah, Mickey Mouse did it and left the fiber evidence. No doubt the laundry manager failed two police lie detector tests. But few are aware of a third test given by the FBI examiner, Richard Ratcliffe. The result? In layman's terms, they passed. He, did, he wasn't involved in killing Jones. Only there you go. After Wayne Williams was convicted of killing two adults, Atlanta's police commissioner closed the books on 21 other murder victims, declaring that and that's where Brown screwed up. Williams. Most were children, among them Clifford Jones and Yusef Bell. But without trials, the mothers were left without a verdict, one way or the other in the deaths of all of the children. Camille Bell. Even if it takes um, 30 trials, I don't care, you know, prove it. That's right. The prosecutor's answer, it would serve no purpose. You can only serve one last sentence. Yeah, but come on. He didn't go into the murders of the other children. And so therefore people who don't understand all that okay it's like this there were a limited amount of people allowed into the courtroom okay news coverage was second hand there were no cameras in the courtroom the the victims families didn't see all the evidence the all 30 children all, all what was it 25 children their family didn't see all the evidence they didn't hear all the evidence no one presented all the evidence to them so they're left out in the dark it's just we say he did it and there they didn't see everything the jury saw okay that's why it's easy for them to accept that it wasn't Wayne Williams because they didn't see what the jury saw this is where the DA screwed up this is where the FBI screwed up this is where the mayor screwed up this is where you know Lee Brown screwed up they failed this they failed the families by not either putting Wayne Williams on trial after the conviction for the other murders or at least putting together some kind of presentation and put or uh, whether on TV or going around to communities and showing them the evidence they failed the community in that sense also and again you think about it you got these well-paid FBI agents and the mayor and Lee Brown the mayor doesn't run again Lee Brown moves to an, uh, another city okay so they don't have to deal with the impact of that and they did a disservice and here we are 40 years later 
still arguing about it and I'm still looking on websites and I'm still looking on Facebook pages I can pull up Facebook pages today that will show you you know some guy some boy who's 25 years old today okay that wasn't around when all this happened or even some guy that is 35 or 40 years old will still sit there and tell you that well my friends mothers dogs hairdressers so and so so and so so he saw some white guys in hoods jump out of van and kidnap Terry Pugh after they hung him on a cross or a tree somewhere you know because they're ignorant and they don't know the facts they don't know the evidence and they you can't blame them all you can do is blame the people in who we paid to solve these things the mayor the police chief the public safety commissioner the FBI the district attorney they failed the families of Atlanta of the murder victims and that's why here I am 40 years later doing these videos I never thought I would ever talk about this stuff ever but for me it offers a little bit of, of closure because even I thought well maybe okay maybe Wayne Williams killed Lee Terrell and a couple other children but what about these other children maybe he didn't have anything to do with it but I'm even more convinced by the evidence I've seen so far that it was Wayne Williams that was heading all the killings on all of them again he may have members of his Gemini crew running around with him either participating knowing about it or having an idea that Wayne Williams was involved and again that's why I think Wayne Williams killed Jimmy Ray Payne that's why I think Wayne Williams killed uh, Nathaniel Cater because they were involved or knew about the murders all right so I've gone over my time I'm gonna stop and uh, we're gonna pick it up again next video with FBI documents we'll keep going on that line and in the next video after that we'll go ahead and finish up on Homer Williams and then the next video after that we'll come back to this again so it's boom 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 there's just so much stuff like I said I could spend the next five years going over all these things all right all right, take care.